And I just want to welcome all those that are rejoining us online. Uh, we're glad that you did join us. And, and so if you have your Bibles, we're, we're going to turn in the Gospel of John. We're going to continue in our, in our study in John. And this morning we're going to pick up where we left off last week at verse 22. Uh, but before we begin, nothing good happens without prayer. So I think I'm going to give you a bit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all who are here. Lord, we pray for all those who are, who are absent from us now and traveling and doing other things and, and lucky enough to be out of this, or blessed enough to be out of this uh, out of this heat. And so, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all who are here. We just ask that you would speak to us in a mighty way today. Give us insight into, into how to deal with this world that hates us so much. And so, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So this morning we're going to look at verses 22 through 25, and we're going to continue to see why Jesus said that the world is going to hate us. Uh, we began to look at that last week, and Jesus said that the world would hate us for several reasons, and we looked at, we looked at three of them. Now you'll recall that Jesus wanted to warn his disciples. You know, this is this is the whole premise of this. He wanted to warn his disciples because he knew that after he left, his disciples are going to return, he, he, you know, before he returns to heaven, that his disciples are going to have uh, some serious, serious trouble. He knew that they were going to face some severe persecution after he was gone, get back to heaven. Um, and, and that persecution was coming from the world. And he wanted, he wanted them to be prepared for the hatred that they were going to encounter on a daily basis in this world and then have a strategy on how they should respond to all that hatred that was coming their way. Uh, now, if you were here with us last week, you know we looked at the first three, um, you know, why the world will hate us, right? We looked at the first three. Jesus gave us three reasons to, uh, for what he gave to his disciples, those three reasons, and he also gives them to us now. I want you to realize that it's not just the disciples that he gave these to, right? This is, this is us. That he's talking about too. So once more, let me tell you where they're at. They're wandering down the valley. They're probably probably in the valley now, and, and wandering down the valley, headed up the other side of the mountain. Uh, and they are they're headed on their way to Gethsemane, where Jesus eventually is going to be. Uh, he's going to be arrested there. And so up until now, in chapter 15, Jesus has been comforting uh, the, these disciples. On this last night, uh, and it is his last night with the disciples before his crucifixion. So this is his, really this is his last night with them. So he's been he's really been giving them a lot of information. You know, it's kind of like if you're going to go on a vacation and you have somebody watching your house, you've got lots of things to tell them in a very short period of time. Amen. Yeah. Well, I need this plant water. I need this. You know, don't forget the dog. You know. <laughs> Anyway, on that last night, not only does he give them the promise, and, and, he's, and we see promise after promise after promise that he gives them, and they're all good promises. And then he also gives them this great promise. It's a warning, actually, of the hatred of the world. It was a message that they didn't want to hear, and guess what? It's one we don't want to hear today. I mean, you want to, you want to hear that? Uh, and that's because for many Christians today, when we look at all this hatred and persecution, it sounds like it would be too complicated. It sounds like it would be too hard of a life. We like our comfortable Christianity here in the West, don't we? Yeah. And we have a lot of trouble identifying with this kind of hatred and suffering, even though the world has, you know, the, the, although the, even though the words that were spoken uh, directly by our Lord, the thought of taking on, you know, that kind of a commitment to, to suffer, kind of commitment to be attacked, uh, it causes us to all cringe, amen? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, I cringe, I, you know, hey, you're going you're gonna to suffer today. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> really, who wants, who wants to be told that they're going to be hated, that they're going to be persecuted, and perhaps even killed for following Jesus? But that was his message to his disciples, and it is his message to us. Okay, so now, now, Let's review why the world hates Jesus Christ and why it continues to hate those of us who have chosen to follow him and who are willing 
take up our cross daily and follow him. Uh, why does the world hate us? Well, you'll recall that Jesus gave us several reasons, and we're going to just whisk through the first three in a real short period of time. First, we saw that the world hates us because we're not of the world. Remember that? We're not of the world. Look at verses 18 and 19. It says, If the world hates you, know that it hated, has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So here we learn that the world hates us because we aren't part of its evil system. It, it, we're just not part of it. We're kind of not in the club, right? You know, in the, and that term world is not the globe that we're, you know, we're not talking about the globe. It, this, this is talking to an organized system and it's ruled by Satan, uh, which is hostile to God and to Christ. The world is a realm where evil reigns supreme. It's, the world is, is comprised of Satan, his evil angels, we call them demons, uh, the wicked and wicked individuals who have aligned themselves against God and against Christ, against the kingdom of God and against God's people. Uh, that's the world. Okay, so, and the world hates everything that has to do with God. Christ or or any of us who belong to him by faith. Any of us. The world hates us. Jesus said, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first. It hated me first. And the reason it hates you, verse 19, is because you're not part of it anymore. I rescue from that, you from that. If you, were, if you were of the world, he says, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Hate you. Therefore, when somebody comes to know Jesus Christ, what happens? When they come to know Jesus by personal faith, they are delivered from that nasty old world, that world that hates God. And, and as he said in verse 19, the world doesn't love you because of that, that reason. You're no longer part of that. Because you are removed from the world, you are removed from the evil system, so they despise us first and foremost. Uh, because we do not belong to the system. We actually violate the system. Uh, and we confront the system every time that we are out in the world. And by living a pure life, we literally rebuke the wicked system of this world by our lives. And Satan, he'll work against that as much as he can. I mean, he'll pull out all the, all the ammunition and go after you. Okay, so the second reason was um, that they hated the Lord, the Lord first. The second reason why the, why the world hates us is that they hated our Lord Jesus Christ first. And because they hated Jesus, the world has turned against us because we represent Jesus. We're his representatives in the world. You, have, you are an ambassador for Christ, for a kingdom that is not of this world. When Jesus said, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And remember, we said that the, world, the, the world's hatred can't be bottled up. You know, have you ever tried really, really, somebody you don't like, you know, you try to hold it in, can't hold it in. The world can't hold it in either. You can't bottle it up. It has to have an outlet. There's got to be a, an outlet. It's kind of like a steam valve that has to give off. The world's hatred just keeps growing and growing and growing, and that steam valve has to go off. And guess who's the steam valve? You can raise your hand. It's you, me, right? So, it, that is all that hatred is directed toward Christ. It is now diverted to us who represent him. And like I said last week, believe me, the world's hatred is just as strong today as it was 2,000 years ago. It may not be as visible to us in the West, but I'll guarantee you, you go into the East and you'll see. You'll see persecution like you never thought was existing. Uh, so people all over the world are dying for their faith today just because they believe in Jesus. Okay, so number three. The third reason the world hates us is because they don't know God. They just don't know God. The people in the world that don't belong to Jesus, they don't know God. Now, now here's the real internal cause of all hate. It's, it's, it's the absence 
of the knowledge of God. God is love, right? So if you know God, you know love. Uh, the, the absence of the knowledge of God is what is the source of hate. Look at, look at verse 21. But all these things they do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. You see, by saying these things, he was saying that they are going to persecute you, they are going to hate you, they are going to kill you because of me, and, and they are going to do it because they don't know God who sent me. They don't know my Father who sent me. He's saying that because, because, that because of me, they're going to do all these things to you. You see, how people react to Jesus' disciples, better or worse, depends on 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 who they are, but on on but not on who they are, but on who Jesus is. See, they're going to treat you different because you belong to Jesus. The people of the world do not know the one who sent me. Jesus said. The implication is that they'd actually, if they had actually known God, honestly, if they had known God. They would have recognized the full revelation of God in Jesus Christ, in his life and in his works. Because of this, not knowing who Jesus is, is the damning proof that, that despite what these people said, they didn't know nearly as much about God as they professed to know. They are always bragging about why we and God were like this, the Pharisees, you know, they were they that they knew about God. Uh, in verses 22 and 24, this concept is going to get developed a little bit further. Now, that brings us to the fourth reason the world hates us, and that's because Jesus exposes the world's sin. He did it then, he does it now. Notice verse 22, Jesus said, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Now, I want you to see that what this verse means, because it really is one of the most important verses that we have in the scriptures. Wow. <laughs> Got quiet in there. That was wild. Uh, so, what does he mean by, by that? What, what does he mean if he did not come? Okay, so, let me, let me, he's not talking about sin in general. I want you to know that right off the top of your head, okay? It's not talking about sin in general. Because whether Jesus had come or not, people are going to sin. We have that sin seed in us, right? And and the, and the Bible makes it clear that everyone is a sinner. It's that's pretty clear too. Uh, even if they've never heard of Jesus, and you go back to Romans three ten for that, you can just continue on. And by looking at the world, everyone can see evidence that there is a Creator. There's no excuse for any of us. We know. Look outside. You see the creation. You no, there's a creator. You can't help it. God says so. Listen to what Romans 1.18 says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse also you go to Romans 3 23 and we learn that all all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God there's not a single person on this planet that is righteous no not one except Christ right everyone has sinned we're all doing things that we inherently know in our hearts are wrong. We know that. Uh, and we've also, since we've all sinned, everyone is guilty in God's eyes. You see, I believe that he's talking about the sin of rejecting the whole truth once you know the whole truth. I think that's the sin that he's talking about. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of other scholars think the same thing. Praise God. You know, but uh, that's what Jesus means. Uh, Reject the whole truth. It, you know, it, it's about his coming. You think about his coming and the wonders that he did. And, you know, it makes, because he did come, it makes people more responsible. It makes people more guilty 
because they've seen it, right? And, and, and the worst thing that anyone can do is have knowledge of God and, and God's revelation in and through Christ and then to reject that. That is the, that is the sin that if you get caught in that sin um, and you die or Christ returns, you're, you're stuck in that condition. In other words, you will be separated from God for eternity. So he's talking about them about the specific sin of rejecting God and willfully turning your back on Christ, willfully spurning Christ. The greatest sin possible is the sin of, of rejecting God's full revelation that he has given us and rejecting Christ, which is rejecting Christ and his message. When the world killed Jesus Christ, I want you to know, that they did so in the face of the full revelation of God in Christ. The full revelation, they didn't have, they, they didn't, God had given them already, he had given them the books of the Old Testament, and, and he, he had given them Jesus. Uh, they had heard what he said. They witnessed everything that he did. They watched his life and his ministry, and then they rejected him and killed him. And as a result, they responded to all that God had revealed to them with contempt, with hatred, with animosity and unbelief. They rejected everything that God could possibly reveal to them. He could, he didn't, he, he really needed to them, he didn't need to reveal anything more than what he revealed to us in Christ. That's it. And, and, and so Jesus, and Jesus is saying, if I hadn't come and given you a full display of revelation, you could have never, you could have never committed the sin of rejecting, rejecting me against that full revelation. But now that I've come and I totally displayed God for you, you rejected that. When you noticed who I was, you rejected that. You committed the sin of totally rejecting the revelation of God, and you have no excuse. Your hypocrisy is over. There's nothing for you to fall back on. Uh, so he says, I came, I completely revealed God to you, and, and you, you wouldn't have been able to commit the greatest sin had I not given you the fullest revelation. But you've done it anyway. And it's happening still today. But Jesus, but when Jesus came along, he re revealed the truth about their religious life. They were very religious people, remember? Uh, he revealed the Father's heart and he exposed their religious hypocrisy. In fact, he had attempted countless times. You, 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 since we've been going through John, countless times. He has he has tried to tell them that that. He and the and the Father are one. They're they're one. Uh, you know, he revealed his Father's heart, and and he had tried to tell them that he was one with the Father, and but and he informed them he was the visible manifestation. We've seen that that he's the visible manifestation of God, and they were the were the same God that they were trying to claim that they worship so vehemently. And since Jesus had shown them the love of the Father and, and literally pretty much opened up the gates of heaven, they had no reason to choose not to believe. But guess what they did? They did. The, they obstinately adhered to their rituals and then they rejected God's own Son. And that's the willful unbelief that we've been talking about all the way through John. Every time he ran into the Pharisees and the scribes, it was always this, this huge curtain, a wall of willful unbelief that he was facing. So we can tell that he was talking about a specific sin of failure to accept Jesus Christ at his words and his and his words and his works. In in chapter uh, in chapter one, verse nine, Jesus is uh, John is speaking of Jesus. He says, the true light, you'll remember this from right in the beginning, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. 
He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Rejecting Jesus' words and his works are therefore uh, a rejection of that true light that we were shown. The fullest revelation was given to us, and therefore it incurs the most central, the most deep-seated guilt in that person's life when, it's, when Jesus is rejected. Since they rejected him, there would be no other way to save themselves. That's another thing to think about. They, have, they, they would live and they would die in their sin if they did not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's John 3, 18. And so when Jesus exposed people's sins, unless the Holy Spirit is convicting them and drawing them to Christ, they always are going to react defensively and sometimes aggressively. As John 3, 19 and 20 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Now I want you to keep this in mind too, that not believing, that not believing is not due to the lack of solid evidence being out there for everybody. There was solid evidence for everyone to see. People heard what Jesus said. They saw the miracles that he did that no one else had ever done before. And we see that in verses 22 and 24. There was nobody, nobody ever on earth like Jesus. Nobody said the things he said. Nobody did the things he did. But they still didn't accept it because he exposed their sin. And even now, there's even more than enough evidence at our fingertips, every single one of our fingertips, uh, to believe in Jesus Christ. But some people choose to ignore the evidence or offer other reasons for not believing because they enjoy. And I'll tell you what those reasons really boil down to. It's because they enjoy their sin. We just learned that in John, right? They 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 love their sin and and they love their sinful lifestyle. Uh, so they don't want to turn from it. That's really what it is. They just don't want to turn from their sin. I can't have fun if I come to Christ, right? I can't have fun. Their total rejection came at the point of total revelation, and it was done. The sin of rejecting Christ. So what does that mean for us? Let's just. Here's a couple little applications here I want to hit before we get to the end. <laughs> it means that if you follow Christ, non believers who know you are going to be threatened by you. And you probably already know that. You probably already know that. Because, because you're living a godly, you're living a godly lifestyle, because you're living that way, you, your lifestyle is going to reveal to them how sinful they are. Just because, just like Jesus' life and his words reveal how sinful the world was, it's a, as a result, it's the same for us. They will end up either, they're going to do something when, when, when your life is, you know, shining a light on their life. They're going to do something. They're either going to attack you falsely, and that happens a lot. Or they're going to try to get you to sin so that you become more like them. And both of those are, are valid. You've got to be on the watch for it. So get ready for the attack. And I'm saying get ready because that's assuming you're living a godly lifestyle. Okay? So also, like the hypocrites in Jesus' time, you, you know, hey, you expose yourself to a harsher judgment, a harsher punishment, if you just come to church and just attend church, but choose not to submit your life to the Lordship of Christ. I mean, just put, putting on some clothes and coming to church is, it doesn't give you a wonderful, I mean, uh, I mean let's, let's, let's just put it this way. It, that's not what's sanctifying you. I mean, this is just, this is where we come to worship. To put it another way, it's always risky to attend a church that preaches the Bible. And you're attending one, okay? 
<laughs> because because in a Bible preaching church, the time will come, and this is why I say it's dangerous for for someone who doesn't believe. It's dangerous because there's going to be a time where you're going to get enough information, and you're going to you're going to you're going to get enough evidence to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. However, if you reject that evidence and refuse to, to turn from your sin, you're going to face harsher punishment in the end for rejecting Christ. And, and that's what he's talking about in here. They're going to receive some pretty harsh judgment. Jesus talks about that, and, and, and if you want to read about that, you can read it in Luke, Luke 12. Listen, people who profess to be religious and worship God and don't know God at all, if they, if they don't know God at all, if they reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, and, 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 and they reject God's revelation. God has given a revelation to all of us. And we've been studying this revelation every week, right? You know, so, um, and verse 22 says, it's going to expose their hypocrisy and their sin. Okay, number five, the world... The fifth reason is the, because the world hates the Father. And how, why do they hate the Father? Well, here's, here's one of the most straightforward statements you ever read. This was not one that I had to scratch my head on. Okay? I mean, sometimes when you read the Bible, it's just crystal clear. Whoever hates me, hates my Father also. Is that a hard one to understand? No. How simple and crystal clear is that? Anyone who hates Christ hates the Father also. He revealed their lack of the, their love for God because their lack of their, because of the lack of their love, well, the lack of love for Jesus. So um, he showed them that it's impossible for them to love God and hate God at the same time. You can't do it. So they so they played you know they, they played a religious game. They were liars and they were they they they, they, they were hypocrites. And they played a religious game. They went to the synagogue, as so many people are in church today. I mean, around this world, there's, there's people that attend church. They perform the rituals. They go through the motions. They check the box. But in essence, they don't worship God because they don't know or love Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, if they hated me, they're also going to hate the Father. People who reject Jesus are ignorant of God. It's true. And, and nowadays, the world wants a watered-down Jesus. You know that. I know that. The world wants a watered-down Jesus, a designer Jesus, one that will turn a blind eye to our guilty sin, right? So, people want a designer Jesus instead of Jesus of God's Word. You know, and they hate God and they don't love Him. Jesus declared in John 5, Verse 23, he said, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now watch this. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so don't be fooled, not even for a moment, don't, don't be fooled into believing that someone can love God but not love his Son, Jesus Christ. It's impossible. It's impossible. You see, on the surface, some people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, on the outside appearance, they may not seem like they hate God, but Jesus says they do. I mean, this is what it says. Jesus said in Matthew 12, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever's not with me is against me. So if you're not for him, you are against him. And that's just how things are. So the world hates and persecutes the followers of Jesus because they don't know or love God. It's, it's, and it's inexcusable to not know God. Uh, because God has given you a full revelation of Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that revelation you are responsible for. Remember what Romans 1 said? That you're, you're without what? You're without excuse. God revealed all that we needed, everything. Okay, number six. Verse 24 follows along the same thought as verse 22. You're going to see a lot of similarities here. But in verse 22, Jesus said it was the things he said uh, that caused them to hate him. And then in verse 24, he says it's his works, the things that he did, that caused them to hate him. 
in verse 24, Jesus said, If I had not done among them the works that, that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have they have seen and hated both me and my father. Now here, both here in, in verse 22 and 24, Jesus presented two major proofs that he was actually God's son. First, the incredible depth of his teaching. When Jesus spoke, it was deep, and people understood that. And the full weight of his words, his words were weighty, and they, and they carried authority. And secondly, the miraculous works that were, that were accomplished, um, and all who witnessed them, um, they all, Jesus pointed out to his disciples, and no one else had ever accomplished these magnificent things that he had. Nobody had ever done that. However, the evidence of his works was rejected as well. It was rejected as well. These works should have dispelled any kind of uncertainty regarding the person of Jesus Christ. They should today, just even, I mean, then and now, if the actions of Jesus were only, only the only thing that, 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 was, that was thought to distinguish him from other teachers, if it was just that, then there would be no room for further debate because Jesus performed miracles that had never been performed by anyone before. No other teacher, no philosopher, no religious leader in the, in the history of the world had done what Jesus has done. So he said, I've displayed the Father in my works and they've seen the Father working through me. And he kept saying that. And yet they rejected his words and they rejected his works. Now I don't know how they can reject his words because I almost find that just totally unbelievable. I mean, but we know that it's true. You remember the raising of Lazarus. You realize that this is not too long ago in, in this passage, right? That Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, they must have known about Lazarus. Yeah, don't you think? I mean, I think they did. That, that Jesus walked up, he said, Martha, you know, I know he's Past and I'm sorry, take away the stone. And you remember Martha said to him, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor because it's been dead four days. You know, I think the King James says, by this time he'll be stinking. Yeah. <laughs> John 11 39, you know, he's been dead four days. Um, he'd been there four days and he would, it would smell awful, but why didn't Jesus want to roll that stone away? I'll tell you, it was to reveal the glory of God. It was to reveal it. Because he said to Martha, he said, Martha, just do it. He said, roll away the stone, get somebody to do that. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you if you believed? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus lifted his eyes, and he prayed to the Father. And, and, and after he had prayed, he cried out. And, and he cried out in a loud voice. He said, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible tells us that Lazarus came out with his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth and Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Now I believe that the raising of Lazarus was the ultimate litmus test. Uh, the ultimate proof that Jesus was who he said he was. I think it's, it's, one, it's one of the, it's right up there with his own resurrection. I mean, Jesus said, Lazarus come forth, and according to the Bible, Lazarus came out. All the processes of death over those four days were reversed, and the death of the decay began to reverse itself, and Lazarus rose up and walked out of the grave. Now I'm positive that they were aware at this point, uh, because they, they had to be aware of that, because they'd seen we, we heard that they didn't see Lazarus around, I mean, after his resurrection, and the word had spread. However, they were so firm, firmly and willfully hardened in their hearts against Jesus that it didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter what he did. No, I'm not going to believe it, right? And with prideful hearts, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit and passionately rejected Jesus Christ. And people continue to do that today. People will continue. In verse 24, Jesus said, I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living, or the Living Bible. Yeah, I love this. 
If I hadn't done such mighty miracles among them, they would, they would not be counted guilty. But as it is, they saw these miracles, and yet they hated both, both, both of us, me and my father. That makes it pretty easy to understand, doesn't it? They heard his words, they witnessed his mighty works, and they saw the manifestation of God, and by rejecting him, they revealed the depths of the world's hatred. You see, sin is at its apex. It's at its, its, its height, the highest point, when someone rejects everything that God has shown them. Uh, and, and I want to warn you this. I, I, I don't know if anybody falls into that category, but I got I got There may be somebody online. Uh, I want to tell you, I have a warning for you this morning. If you've heard the gospel, uh, the gospel story, if you've heard the story of Jesus, and, and you've seen what it was like when he was here on earth, and, you, and, 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 and you've seen what he did to show us who God was, and God is, but you have never accepted him, I can guarantee you that each day you are getting closer and closer to the point where your final rejection of him, if you're caught in that state, could send you to hell for all eternity. It's plain and simple. That's just what the Bible says. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, I want to encourage you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord while, while your heart is actually still open and ready to receive that word. There's a time, you don't know when that is, but that kind of gets shut off because you pushed him away too many times. Listen, but his miraculous works, his, his miraculous works, which were unmatched by anyone else in history, led to one crystal clear conclusion that Jesus and the Father were one. All those works, they just showed him that Jesus was one. But despite that, the reaction of the, overwhelm, of the overwhelming evidence was unbelief. All that overwhelming evidence, and it was unbelief. Jesus knew they hated him, and thus they hated the Father as well. And then in verse 25, Jesus brings, it, brings this discussion to a close. Uh, and, and he says, he says, the world hates without a cause. Uh, revealing his conclusion, but the word that is written in their law must be. But that the world, ah, excuse me. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They can't be without cause. Jesus assured his disciples that this is going to be expected. You should expect this. The world hated Jesus, and consequently, all of his followers are going to be hated. And it's going to be without cause. The first half of this statement said, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. So what does he mean by that? It means the scriptures testify to this age-old struggle between God's people and, and their God. And, and their great God. They had rejected God's prophets, many of whom were imprisoned and executed. They had done that all along. Those who stood firmly for the word of the Lord were hated, despised, shunned, and killed. But the prophets, they remained faithful. And the Lord's word echoed down through the years, verifying all the details of his earthly visit in all the prophecies that we've read. The second statement is taken from Psalm 69 and Psalm 35, where David predicted that they would hate and reject the Messiah. David said, more in number than the, than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Uh, more than the number of my head. So Jesus quoted a portion of Psalm 69, 4 to show that the people's reaction to Jesus had been prophesied. And also, verses 22 through 24, Jesus said that he had spoken enough words and performed enough miracles among them to hold them accountable for, for, for their sin. He did that so that when they hated him, they would be hating him without cause. No cause. So do you know what God did out of his great grace? God took away every reason why someone would hate Jesus. He took it all away. And if you keep hating Jesus, you only have your, your own sin in your life to blame. 
There's no reason to hate Jesus. God says it was prophesied that people are going to hate him for no reason at all. That's, that's, that's what it says. And listen, God structured the whole revelation of, 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 of in Christ, the whole revelation that he gave to us in Christ, so that the, if a person hates Christ, it's for no other reason than their own selfish sinfulness. It's just because they want their way. God revealed so much to us. God gave us so much so much grace. He gave us so much love. The fact that, 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 that God made Jesus Christ so lovely and so blameless and so appealing and magnetic and compelling and desirable means that, it, that if an individual cho chooses to continue in their sin, they're going to continue to hate Jesus Christ and it'll be for no cause. No cause other than their own sin. God did everything he, he could and, and still does everything he can to save people and keep them from going to hell. He doesn't want any to perish. And God planned that the coming of Jesus Christ would be such a perfect and full sign that if people hated Jesus, it would, it would be because of their own sin. It would just be because of their sin, not because of anything else. That's the way he designed it. Listen, there's nothing about Jesus. I was telling David this earlier this week. There is absolutely nothing about Jesus that would make you want to hate him. Nothing. Amen? Amen. Uh, there is nothing about him that would make you hate him. Anyone who hates him, hates him without a cause. But God wanted us to make sure uh, that everyone, every excuse was gone. He wanted to make sure that there was no excuses so that a person could only blame their own sinfulness or not. For not loving Jesus. Well, let me just say a few things as I quote. What we've seen here is when the world hated Jesus, they hated him because he exposed their sin. He revealed really who they were. And they didn't like it. Still don't like it. And when Jesus revealed the people's sins, they rebelled and they hated him because he removed the darkness and revealed what was in their hearts. And instead of turning to him in love and faith and accepting his salvation and cleansing of their sin, they, they turned against him and they hated him for exposing their wickedness. And, and the world is still hates Jesus. Nothing has changed and the world still continues to hate those of us who are his, who live for him and who love him. And so, if you're going to count the cost, and, I, and you should count the cost, God says, God says you should count the cost uh, of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're going to find out that a true disciple, true discipleship necessitates, it's necessary. You must have a willingness to, to, to suffer the hatred of the world if you're going to live for him. You're going to have to be willing to suffer the hatred. And if you're not willing to suffer the hatred of the world, then you're not, then you're you're then you're really not willing to be a disciple the way that God wants you to be a disciple. Uh, if you if you don't get because that's all part of it. The world system is going to hate you. Just know it. But in spite of the world's hatred, we should testify to the world about the truth about Jesus Christ. And Jesus left left us here in this world to claim His glory. In Acts 1, Jesus gave us the reason why we're still here. In Acts 1, 8, he said that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But how can we bear witness in the face of such a hostile and angry world? I mean, how, how can we do that? Well, Jesus says that we can, we can do that only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at that next week because that's, that's our next passage. So as I close, I want to handle the same challenge that I gave you last week because uh, I heard a lot of people say, that's good. You just keep challenging us. I'm going to challenge you again. Stand for Christ. Please. Stand for Jesus. If you're a believer, I don't want to have you expose sin for what it is. You're going to be around people that are sinful people and just expose that sin. Of course, with a heart that, that cares what's going to happen to them. Call it what it is. What 
of the bystands, confront it, confront it. And then ask the Lord for opportunities to share his love with others. I mean, there's others around you that need his love. And listen, if you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ and you, you haven't really pulled the trigger on that yet, and you're watching online, you haven't pulled the trigger on that yet, I say to you today that now is an acceptable time. Jesus said so. Today is the day uh, to choose Jesus and choose life because what you do with Jesus is going to seal your eternity. I hope that you never have to think about that statement I just made in retrospect and wishing you had done something. Uh, and like I said before, it's not going to be, if you do come to Christ, it's not going to be an easy road. And don't believe anybody that says it's going to be an easy road. Don't you dare believe anybody else that says it's going to be an easy road. It's not easy. It's easy because you have someone to go through it with you, right? Uh, but he does. He, he gives us it's the best road that he can give us because he loves us and, and he, he forgives us and he cleanses us and he makes us he makes us where we have a clean slate for God and 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 he gives us the promise of heaven and eternal life if you choose him if you just choose him. So that's what I say if you haven't chosen, choose him. Let's pray. Now, Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. And I thank you. I thank you that, you know, we're supposed to give thanks in all things. And I do thank you that we're going to run into persecution, we're going to run into trials, but it's so good to know that you're always there with us. So, Lord, I pray that if there's any here that haven't received Christ, or somebody watching online that hasn't received Christ, Lord, I just pray that they would they would do that this morning, that they would open their hearts to him. Uh, and, and that we, as Christians, would live for the glory of God. That we would truly be uh, a shining example of what it is to be a, a follower of Jesus. Help us to confront our world boldly and fearlessly in order to bring others to Christ. Uh, in, in, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.